And now uh, we're going to go back to my favorite topic, uh, which is uh, financial reform, uh, because it's obvious that uh, the legislators in this country and the White House do not have this thing figured out, and nor do they have the people in place uh, that have it figured out. Uh, somebody who's going to help us figure it out is uh, author John Gillespie. He, along with uh, David Swig, wrote the book Money for Nothing, and uh, and I think it's uh, on, an, on a very specific issue that I really want to discuss. So, uh, John, welcome to the Young Turks. All right, th uh, thanks, Jenks. Glad to be here. All right, uh, let, let's talk about, talk about corporate boards because mm -hmm. uh, I th the reason I think that's pivotal to this is uh, if you own a company, you have all the incentive in the, in the world to make sure it doesn't blow up. Uh, you know, with our company here, I don't want to take too many risks uh, because uh, I don't want to lose the company. And we know that all the partnerships where they, the people running the company still maintain the company uh, did not take these risks and did not blow up uh, during this crisis. Uh, but the corporations did. So first, let's have a discussion about that incentive structure in the corporations that you think might have led to that. Well, I think one of the biggest hidden problems that led to the entire economic meltdown was the absolute utter lack of leadership in the boardrooms and many of the corporations that blew up but also others throughout the country uh, the, the biggest problem is that the boards of directors who are supposedly elected to represent the people putting up the money the shareholders who are looking to uh, have their shares grow for their retirement or their kids college or whatever uh, aren't representing the shareholders. They're representing, in most cases, the CEO who brought them uh, into the boardroom to begin with. So if they don't represent the shareholders and the incentive of the executives is to make as much money in the short run as possible, well, obviously, then they have a very perverse incentive to take too much risk because if they lose the company, they're not really losing their own money. Yeah, it, it's, it's shocking, but most directors have very little, if any, of their own personal wealth invested in the company. It's, it's almost all money given to them by the shareholders in either stock or uh, stock options or uh, cash. And um, they don't really represent shareholders' interests. The, the CEOs select them or, or at the very least approve them, uh, and then they're in charge of their renominations, their perks, their pay, almost all their information, the committee assignments, the agendas, and they get captured by the CEOs and, and then uh, rubber stamp incentive compensation schemes that, as, as you point out, uh, incur so much risk that the companies blow up when there's a downturn. So, John, that's what I want to focus on. How does the board get captured? Because, theoretically, the shareholders are supposed to pick the board. Um, but how is it structured so that that doesn't really happen in effect? It, it, it's amazing that uh, our corporations are probably the least democratic uh, institution in our society. Uh, the head of the SEC uh, back uh, eight years ago, Bill Donaldson, compared it to the old Soviet-style elections. They self-nominate uh, a slate, uh, one person for each position, and you can either vote for them or you can abstain. You, you can't vote against them. Uh, you wait, wait, wait. Let, let's go back for a second. So you say they nominate. Who is they? Who's nominate? The, the board themselves uh, uh -huh. uh, select who will be put up for nomination. Well, don't they have a <laughs> pretty obvious incentive to select themselves? They do, and, 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 the, and that's what you end up seeing. Uh, the average board member is a wealthy, white, uh, elderly male. Uh, there are only one out of seven board members of the 500 largest companies in the country is a woman. Minorities are horribly underrepresented. But the, the real problem isn't just the demographics and gender problems. That's bad enough. But the perception problems and the culture problems and the uh, experience problems, a very narrow set of entrenched individuals who are running these organizations that are supposed to be an engine for our future savings. Okay, now let, let's go continue in the process. They nominate themselves. You said the shareholders can't vote no. That that can't be true. No, that's the way that's the way it works in this country. Uh, in other countries, uh, in almost every and, and, and even worse, you can't get rid of them once they're on if they're if they're not serving the shareholders' interest. Most other countries, five to ten percent of the shareholders can put up 
a nominee for the board, uh, or they can call for an extraordinary general meeting, as it's called, and remove a director that's that's uh, doing a bad job. The, neither of those are, are uh, available in this country. At this John, point. I'm ha literally having trouble believing you. <laughs> okay, I mean, I knew the problem was bad, but I didn't. I can't believe that. And we're talking to the author of Money for Nothing. The website is moneyfornothingthebook.com. Wait a minute. Now, let's say I'm extraordinarily wealthy, and I mm -hmm. decide I'm going to go buy 51% of IBM. Right. Okay, and I, and I do. Or, hell, I buy 10% of IBM, okay? Mm -hmm. And I say, you know what, these board guys, I don't like the guys on the board. I think they've been making all the wrong decisions. That's why I bought it, because I think I got a lot of value I can get uh, uh, on this transaction. Right. So I'd like to replace guys on the board. How do I do it? Uh, you would have to go through a process uh, of spending uh, millions of dollars to um, get them onto a ballot. And that's occasionally done by hedge funds that are looking to make a, a quick profit uh, by, getting, by getting control of the company sometimes. Uh, but in general, a shareholder that's trying to get the company to work properly, and we've seen some effort by pension funds, particularly public pension funds, to, to try to improve governance. But the, the, the general problem is that uh, they don't have enough votes, and even if they did, the process doesn't allow them to make changes. And there's very what, little transparency or accountability within these boards. Uh, I, I think a lot of people don't know the process. So when you say, including myself, when you say get them on the ballot, what right. does that mean? Well, um, it, 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 as I was pointing out, the uh, ability to be selected as a director comes from the people on the board themselves. So it's a self-perpetuating, entrenched narrow group of people who uh, pick people they're comfortable with. So they get into a boardroom and uh, get tunnel vision and group think, even if they have the best intentions. And, and most, are, you know, most are not crooks, but they, they have a narrow point of view, and it gets uh, presented in rubber stamping the the position of the executives in, in most cases. So the shareholders if, really don't have any recourse. So if a shareholder wants to get a new board member, he has mm -hmm. to convince the existing board to get rid of one of their own and replace them with someone else they're suggesting? Is that right? Right. right. In, in, in this country, you're not able to uh, nominate people for the board. You, you might, in uh, cases, at least embarrass the board into... It, you know, if something has become public, there's an outrage constraint where they'll get rid of a bad CEO or take some action to reform the board if enough embarrassment is occurring. But otherwise, there's really not any legal recourse or an ability to, to change it in any democratic way. Uh, well, that sounds so mental that <laughs> I don't think <laughs> anyone should ever buy a stock of any company because you don't really own the company. Well, I, I think a lot of people, as a result of the meltdown, where you saw companies like Merrill losing $60 billion for shareholders, or Lehman, $45 billion, and, and at the same time endangering the entire world economy, or GM losing $52 billion of shareholders' money with a bad CEO and a bad strategy, that was rubber stamped by the board, that shareholders actually, uh, and a lot of people kind of are in danger of, of not trusting the markets uh, for very good reason, and, and that could hurt our ability to have companies grow in the way that they should by getting investors to put up money to, uh, to have products and, uh, and innovation done within companies. All right, before we get to the fix, one last thing. Can the CEOs influence who's on the board? Can they... Is there a, a subtle or nuanced way that they can influence uh, to get their own friends or associates, whatever, people they know on, on their own boards? It's unfortunately not in the least subtle. Uh, in the 500 largest companies in the country, 62% of those companies have the CEO also serving as the chairman of the board, which is a, a blatant conflict. Their uh, <laughs> board is crazy. supposed to be monitoring the CEO and the executives, as well as advising them. And here you have a system where uh, the CEO in most of these companies is monitoring himself. 18% uh, of those companies have the former CEO as the chairman of the board. And our, one of our proposals is to uh, outlaw that. Uh, the so-called independent directors on most, in most companies these days 
the, the definition of independence would allow somebody whose college roommate and football team partner uh, who they play golf with every Sunday to be considered independent. And too many directors fall into that, that category where the independence is, is anything but. Uh, I, I can give you one quick example that was, was pretty shocking. Uh, the, Disney, uh, when Michael Eisner was running it uh, seven or eight years ago, uh, the board consisted of his personal lawyer, the principal of his kids' elementary school, the architect for his own house, the president of a university he'd donated a million dollars to, uh, the former chairman who'd hired him, a U.S. senator who, former senator who'd done consulting work for uh, Disney, and, and friends of his who were actors. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a joke. It was, well, it, it, it was, except when you step back and then you see bad decisions being made and tens of billions of dollars being lost from uh, decisions where the board's job is to say, hey, wait a minute, uh, and at least question some bad strategies or, or uh, policies. And then you see what happened to Merrill Lehman, GM, most of the uh, larger banks in the country, Bear Stearns, uh, and where, where they blow up in people's lives, the employees, the customers, the uh, not just the shareholders, but a, a huge group of people influenced by the company are hurt. You know, I, I want the audience to understand the ramifications, because if it's Eisner and his buddies who get to decide how much Eisner makes and how little they give back to the people who actually own the company, the shareholders, mm -hmm. right. well, obviously they're going to decide that Eisner needs to make a tremendous amount of money, and the shareholders don't need that much money back. Okay. And, and, and you see hundreds of millions of dollars being siphoned off of companies as a result. Just, just in the last week, uh, the ludicrous situation of having the average bonus being announced at some of the bailed out banks, the taxpayers bailed out, uh, the average bonus for some of the bankers is 24 times what the average American has in their life savings. And those savings are down because of bad decisions in some of the boardrooms in those very same banks. Right. And, of course, there's one uh, other aspect to it. You know who a lot of the shareholders are? Um, you guys listening, uh, because yeah, your yeah. pension funds are the ones that are the suckers in this game. Right. Pe people often don't think of themselves as shareholders, even though they are. Uh, and they're certainly stakeholders if you're a customer or an employee or live in a community affected by the companies. But we all have a huge amount of our uh, money that you don't think of as, as owning shares in individual companies uh, invested through mutual funds or your company's pension fund uh, or your 401k um, in these companies. And you should have a vote. Uh, most people throw out the ballots for good reason because their vote's meaningless. But if we made it meaningful, uh, we think some of these companies could be turned around and, and actually serve the shareholders instead of the executives a bit more. We're talking to John Gillespie along with David Swig. They wrote the book Money for Nothing. You could find out more about it at moneyfornothingthebook.com. Between them, they have 30 plus years in Fortune 100 uh, companies. They both got Harvard MBAs, so th they know what they're talking about. So, <laughs> real quick here, John, let's let's get to the solutions. So, how do we change this? If you had to pass a law that would say X, Y, and Z, what would that say? Well, the last chapter in the book uh, talks about some companies that are doing it right and some good directors, but also has uh, two dozen recommendations that we think could turn the situation around if people uh, got themselves informed, saw some of the scandalous things going on that are hidden behind closed doors, using the shareholders' own money to hide it. Uh, the main things that we're suggesting are uh, creating a new class of public directors that uh, – get special training. It's an idea that uh, was actually developed uh, about 80 years ago by William O. Douglas um, when he was the SEC commissioner right after the Great Depression. And um, this idea of public directors who would actually be independent uh, would need to be included among the nominees in companies. We also suggest having a split of the chairman and the CEO uh, and requiring an truly independent chairman, uh, required directors to have real investments in the companies, allow the extraordinary general meeting and nominations uh, by a sufficient uh, percentage of 
shareholders were suggesting 10 percent, um, require them to disclose lobbying expenses. Currently, companies, and with the Supreme Court decision last week, it's going to get worse, can take shareholders' own money and spend tens of millions of it to lobby against reforms of this uh, rotten system that uh, are against shareholders' interest, and <laughs> that you're paying for it yourself. Uh, so we're, we're, we're suggesting at least disclosing that and uh, possibly restricting it again somehow with legislation. And then uh, open the nominating process uh, and requiring a lot more disclosure on what goes on in the boardroom instead of having the board members uh, do check-the-box things and then shred their, their notes before they leave the boardroom so they aren't liable for anything. And can can we also agree that w we should be allowed to vote no on board members? <laughs> yes, we, uh, we've got a whole section suggesting how to have real shareholder uh, input and in democracy, and we think that could allow for some of the diversity uh, issues that I was talking about to be resolved. J John, it, final, final question for you. I, I don't know if you've seen this. Have you seen Maxine Waters' legislation on this? Um, I'm going House. down to Washington and, and talking with Barney Frank's committee where there are a number of bills that will be addressed in some hearings later in the year. Hers is one of them, and there's some others in, in the hopper, and Schumer has one in the Senate that would do a few of these things, but very little of it is um, comprehensive or, or, or dealing with the culture problems in the boards. So, But it, uh, there is support for it, and people like uh, Congresswoman... Uh, Waters have, have made good suggestions, and it gives us hope that there'll be some real action this year if people get informed and outraged enough to demand it. Okay. Well, I'd love to get your thoughts on it once we have a bill. You know, once the House has decided on a bill, or sure. You I'm, know, I'm, because I'm hoping to uh, be personally involved, and I hope your listeners will uh, get themselves informed and, and outraged enough to, to to make demands on not just the Congress, but through their um, powers that should be the case but aren't right now in the companies that they are the actual owners of. Right, because in my mind, this is at the heart of saving capitalism. Because and, yeah, and, and, and uh, David and I, in writing this book, were, you know, we went to Harvard Business School, we've worked in business. We think this is ruining capitalism, and not just capitalism, but the life savings of, of uh, hundreds of millions of Americans and jeopardizing the world economy. And it's a, it's a hidden problem that can be fixed and should be fixed and, and uh, could help us all. Yeah, because if the owners of the companies don't actually have say in how to run the companies, it's a guaranteed recipe for disaster, as we've seen before, and unfortunately we will see again if we don't fix it. And then the next time we're all out of money, and then people begin to question the capitalist system overall, when in no, fact there's a critical close, problem with it. We, we came so close to it all going down the drain a little over a year ago, and with companies as interconnected and complex and dependent on uh, financing uh, that, that's very, very intricate and complicated, this could blow up in a way that, that uh, puts us way back in, uh, in, in our economic welfare. All right. The book is called Money for Nothing. The website is moneyfornothingthebook.com. John Gillespie is the author. Thank you so much for joining us, John. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. All right. Watch the live show at theyoungturks.com.